Hello, welcome to another audiobook by Stuart Wilde, Silent Power. In this audio program, Stuart reads his book. Silent Power, Chapter 1, The Getting of Wisdom. Every so often you meet a person who is very different. You can't put your finger on what it is that attracts you to this individual, but he or she exudes a mystery and strength, radiating a silent power that is strange and beguiling. What is this unseen force? Why do some have it and most do not? Here in this tiny book, I'll tell you about the power, its mystery, and how to get it. There's a simple trick you have to learn. Once you've got that, silent power becomes your unspoken credential. It's a charisma that gradually grows and develops around you. Through it, you can express a special goodness that helps people and this planet to change for the better. From your silent power comes flow. From that flow comes simplicity of heart. From simplicity of heart comes contentment. Some people, such as martial arts masters, gain silent power over the years anyway. They do it via emotional control and physical discipline, which quiets their energy naturally. They exude an effortless strength. Physical exercise and discipline are valuable in developing silent power because they help you control the destructive side of the ego. But you need more than just a good physique and fitness. You need awareness as well. In the etheric, you see how the human condition is complicated by the ego personality, but you can have a deep compassion for it. For a human is not just a mind, a body, or an emotion. It is light. The brilliance of that human light overshadows the personality traits and weaknesses that come from human frailty. So the first step to the mystery of silent power is to strengthen your psychological and emotional attitudes. This will boost your sense of well-being. It would also help you externally, as people will see from your body language, by what you say, by your general attitude, that you're strong. Intellectually, they will think you're strong, but inwardly, at a subconscious level, they will feel and know that you're strong. They will automatically react positively. People like controlled strength. It makes them feel safe and supported. Come, let's start by considering what power really is. And then we'll discuss leaning and not leaning. I'll show you something obvious, something that 99% of the population don't see. Chapter 2. The Power Hungry, the Power Starved. What is normally considered to be power is not real power at all. Chasing money, glamour, sex, wanting control over others, political and military power are all manifestations of the ego. They are often glorified forms of showing off. They dwell in the currency of the ego, and they often appeal only to other egos, so they're subject to people's whims. A person can be rich and successful and still be very weak. Money doesn't give you real strength. It just keeps you comfortable while you experience your dysfunction. The world of the ego is brittle, fragile, and insecure. It never really feels safe, and it has no lasting worth. The ego's world dies. More often than not, it self-destructs. With the explosion of the mass media and the information superhighway, glamour, hype and showing off have replaced true worth. The 30 second soundbite is more important than real facts. A glossy, skimmed down version of life is all that anyone has time for, as each vies with the other for a momentary place in the sun. Many people are victimized by their egos. They feel power starved, and so they crave to be special. Of course, Everyone is special in their own spiritual way, but the mass media has heightened people's need to seek fame and attention. Thirsting for power, in the ego sense of power, they go through the ludicrous chase of trying to be important, trying to become special in the eyes of others, seeking praise, seeking status. This frenetic chase destroys and saps their energy. Because the ego is insecure, its fears need to be quelled, so it dominates our psychology, firing off endless demands. It desperately wants things, right now, that will help it feel better. We're programmed as children to make the ego important and to try to keep it happy. And this mesmerizes us into reacting to its every need. We don't realize that controlling the ego through discipline is a lot simpler than trying to satisfy it all the time. By gratifying the ego, one may get a fleeting respite from its cravings and demands. But then it's on to the next gratification. The ego always wants more. 
It's life on a mouse wheel, each trotting as fast as possible to stay in the same place. Endless effort, misspent on illusion. You can see why people are programmed into it. They are psychologically immature. It's all a bit sad. Trying to be someone comes from an insecurity which stems from the ego's need for observers and admirers. It needs acknowledgement and stimulation to feel solid. But leaning psychologically and emotionally out into the world, demanding to be noticed, trying to be cool, seeking approval and acceptance, trying to impress, seeking praise and respect, creates imbalance and weakness. It is, in fact, an affirmation that says, I'm not okay. I need others to approve of me in order to feel secure. By leaning psychologically, you weaken yourself. Imagine constantly leaning forward at a severe angle, reaching out. You're perpetually poised, heading for a fall. Trying to win people over and hoping the world will accept you for your wonderfulness is futile and weak. It destroys your real power. The stress of it can make you ill. Even if you get what you want, it rarely lasts. Today's success becomes tomorrow's rejection. Leaning psychologically is a fault. It undermines what you are. Gradually you become the manifestation of other people's reality. Subject, of course, to all their fickle whims, moods and power trips. By accommodating the ego in this way, you drift from the real spiritual you that dwells within, which is contained and solid, to a fake you that is brittle, self-indulgent and powerless. You can tell people how marvellous you are, and a hundred others can sing your praises and pump your worth. But all that is PR and hype. In the end, you're only worth the etheric feeling you exude. That is a spiritual, metaphysical reality. Everything else is illusion and dysfunction. If you want to be accepted, accept yourself. If you want to be acknowledged, acknowledge yourself. Simple. Let's leave hype and clatter, which are weak, and head to the less obvious, silence, where consolidation and real strength lie. Chapter 3. The Silent Consolidation of Power Let's talk about psychological consolidation, then on to other practical ideas for solidity and calm. My martial arts teacher says that when people go through the motion of walking, what they're doing in effect is going through a controlled fall. They lean forward with their upper bodies and throw out a leg just in time. That's why even a small crack in the pavement can tip them over. Psychologically and emotionally, life is the same as walking for most people. They constantly lean into life, yearning, dreaming, pining. They're often dissatisfied with what they are and with what they have. Instead, they seek someone or something to lift them up. They want to be declared special. They want life easy, delivered on a plate. In the process of leaning, they trash their emotional balance and drift from one gratification to another. They exist at the edge of their balance and their ability to control. One adverse condition, a casual remark, a small setback, and their energy collapses. Psychologically and emotionally, they fall on their noses. The initial point in consolidating your silent power is to discipline yourself to stop leaning. When you are the most desperate to lean in on other people, that's when you should exercise control. The game is called Stand Straight in Life. Not many have heard of it. First, don't lean towards things you don't have. Affirm, visualize, and take action instead. Second, try not to lean into the future by talking or thinking about it constantly. Instead, take time each day to make the now special, honoring what you do have and what you have achieved. Avoid what I call planitis, endlessly making plans and talking about them. One day, some day, Trashes your power and gets you nowhere. No results and no action. Third, start to design your life so that you don't require things from others. Try to need only those things you can get yourself and don't suck on people emotionally or intellectually. When you lean psychologically or emotionally on people or toward them, it's a sure sign of insecurity. It makes others feel uncomfortable. They resent the weight you are trying to lay on them and they will react by denying you. They don't like your self-indulgence, and your insecurity reminds them of their own vulnerability. It rattles them. Animosity builds. Consciously and subliminally, they sense the weakness your leaning creates. It robs them of energy and crowds them. They have to buy into your needs and emotions when they would prefer to concentrate on their own. 
They don't like the imposition and often they react negatively, even if they don't say so. Alternatively, they accept the imposition of your weight, but then they feel that they can take advantage of you emotionally, sexually or financially. They will feel empowered to use you or deprecate you or discredit you in some way. Remember, when your energy touches others, they subliminally know if you're weak or strong. It affects how they see you. I'm sure you know what I mean. Visualize someone who leans on you. Replay in your mind the emotions and thoughts that their leaning generates in you. Remember how you react to their sometimes desperate needs. Notice how often they rob you of your energy, how in minutes you feel exhausted. Don't do that to others, it disempowers you. A little unemotional leaning in some circumstances can be okay. Others may feel pleasure in supporting you or assisting you, but too much leaning and they will vote no. It does not mean that you can't ask for help. Sometimes you can, but there's a difference between asking dispassionately for help and constantly leaning on others emotionally, demanding that they ameliorate your inadequacy or insecurity. Thus, an important first step in silent power is don't lean. It's obvious, but most don't know it. When you're frantic for people, your needs have an air of desperation. They weaken you and push things away from you. Have you ever had a romantic relationship where the other person was all over you like a hot rash, desperate for you? What did you do? Probably for the first few days you enjoyed the attention, but then on day three you gave this man or woman a hard time and you started to tow him or her around by the nose. You enjoyed that for a bit, but in the end this desperation and insecurity bugged you. Eventually you tossed the person out. When you're in love and you crave someone, if this individual keeps his or her distance or retreats from you, then your desire increases. If this person advances too far forward, your desire lessens or may dissipate completely. When you're desperate for a deal and you lean into it, you push it away and or you wind up paying more. It's called wanting it tax. Before every deal, take a moment in the hallway to remind yourself that you don't need it. If you don't get it, it doesn't bother you. If you do get it, it'll be under your terms and you won't pay too much. Even if your natural tendency is to lean on people because, let's say, you're a very social person, don't lean. Make that a discipline. You can be social without leaning in. Put a sign on your refrigerator door. When in doubt, lean out. Silent power often requires the contrary approach. When others lean, step back. When they cry out, remain silent. When they run, you walk. Stay in control and exude stability, even if you don't feel sure of yourself just yet. Don't show your weakness. Be strong, be brave. Internalize any disquietude and work on it later. Initially, you may not be completely solid inwardly, but you can still come across as solid externally. The inward power comes as you act out and affirm your strength and control. Through your solidity, you help others feel secure. They seek you out, life gets easier, and it feels much better. Become the sage, remain composed, be silent, stand straight, etherically. Stay inside what you know, be content, don't have too many needs, work on yourself. Anyway, you're probably stronger than you think. Many of the people you meet may initially seem solid, but they soon expose themselves, and you can see that they are in fact in silent crisis, victims of their egos. Their real power is weak and polluted. It leaves them open and exposed to the ups and downs of life. They will constantly seek to etherically borrow energy, sucking on any life force they can find. They will have house plants that die and pets that get sick a lot. There is a law in physics that allows subatomic particles to borrow energy for just a millisecond. The particle moves temporarily to a faster orbit, but an instant later it has to repay the borrowed energy. It falls decays to its ground state, a slower oscillation that it can more comfortably sustain. Etherically, humans follow the same laws. You can borrow energy from another, but you can't inherit it perpetually. A small boost, and then back you go to where you were before. Etheric suckers grab your power as you pass them. It depreciates you. At a deep subconscious level, they drag you away from life and closer to death. However, before you get too indignant, I have to tell you that we all pull energy from others occasionally, especially when we're tired or emotionally drained. As your energy sinks, it's human to reach for the nearest life raft. In answer to your question, how do I protect my energy, I've included a few ideas in Chapter 9, 
Meanwhile, let's return to silent power for the moment. People don't resonate silent power because, for most, the overriding issue in life is security. The ego's function is to keep you focused on staying alive. Everyone is out and about trying to do just that. The issues of security dominate your psychology, everything you do, and much of what you say. It undermines your strength. Everyone is silently preoccupied and worried about something. So the etheric energy is diffused and disconcerted, in some more so than in others. People worry about death and violence. They worry about things changing or dying, not just their bodies. Anything that has the potential to change worries them. The death of a relationship, the death of a job, death of a daily rhythm that they're used to, the death of a privileged position and so on. As I said in my book, Weight Loss for the Mind, it's the death of things that scares people. The mind functions in this way. If this relationship falls apart, I'll fall apart. My job might go, and with it, my lifestyle. And following that, my body may change from alive to not alive. At the deep subconscious level, an argument with the boyfriend becomes a threat. A life and death struggle, not just a discussion about the dispute in question. That's why people can get so upset about things that seem trivial. There's an energy war going on, each seeking to preserve their etheric life force, while consciously or subconsciously they're in a titanic struggle with the demons of insecurity. When they're not worrying about dropping dead, they're usually thinking about themselves, preening the ego with self-satisfying thoughts, brushing its little tail and generally making themselves as special as possible. If they aren't thinking about themselves, they're talking about themselves, keeping others amused with thrilling concepts of life in the slow lane. More often than not, they're calling on you to listen, to notice, and to acknowledge them, to observe them. It can be exhausting. Don't do it to others. Stay inside your power, where you feel the most secure, and work on controlling the ego. Discipline it, so that you can move from its fragile world to the immortal certainty of spirit. There you'll feel the eternity within you, and your insecurity will gradually melt. You'll accept life as you find it, rather than struggling against it, and you'll know that there's no death and no failure. So accept the comings and goings of life and flow to your highest good with little resistance and great joy. The more you control your emotions and the reactions of your personality, the more consolidated and powerful your etheric becomes. Once your etheric energy is no longer jerking back and forth, wobbling and squirming and falling over itself, a gracious solidity develops around you. Now you'll be able to see through your own etheric to the world of pure energy beyond. A quantum leap takes place within and a great perception descends upon you. But, remember, silent power is a strength you quietly express, not one you wield. It's born from the seeds of self-control. The Tao Te Ching says, to understand others is to have knowledge. To understand oneself is to be illuminated. To conquer others needs strength. To conquer oneself is harder still. To be content with what one has is to be rich. Chapter 4. Silent Talking Part of learning not to lean is to get control of your dialogue. Most people talk too much, and what they do say is often just noise or irrelevant gibberish designed to keep themselves entertained. One of the keys to silent power is to control your need to talk. The rules of this consolidation are as follows. Make it a discipline not to discuss your personal details with others. Develop mystery, silence, and a secrecy about your life. Don't allow people to know your deep innermost self. Sure, you may have a friend you want to discuss things with from time to time, but generally speaking, don't talk about yourself. If you have to, do so only in general terms and only when people ask you. Of course, sometimes a situation may require you to talk about yourself. For example, in an office situation where you have to describe your abilities. But for the most part, keep quiet. If you have to give instructions or if you need to share your feelings when setting a personal boundary with another person, perhaps, choose your words carefully. A powerful person doesn't waste words, doesn't waffle and drift, but instead thinks through what he and she wants to say and expresses these thoughts succinctly and purposefully. The most powerful way to speak is with brevity. Next, when engaging in dialogue with others, try to remain underneath them psychologically rather than talking across them or even down to them from above. Let me explain. Talking above people is trying to make them feel inferior, pushing yourself onto them, or attempting to force your ideas upon them. It's dominating the conversation with endless tales of your experiences, hogging the stage. If these people say that they've been to China, and you respond by saying you've been there 19 times, you're trying to get above them, and you're being combative. 
Sages don't need to combat. They're eternal and infinite and a part of everything. In the everything, there is no high or low, so they have no need to compete. They can just be. It's enough. The Tao says, those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know. It goes on to say that once one has achieved self-control, the mysterious leveling, a perception of the infinite self follows, whereupon life is not limited by your talking or by your need to define it, and you in turn are free of its definitions, eternal. The Tao talks of this process of self-control. Quote, This is called the mysterious leveling. He who has achieved it cannot either be drawn into friendship or repelled, cannot be benefited, cannot be harmed, cannot be raised up or humbled, and for that reason is the highest of all creatures under heaven. End quote. This means that the sage is the highest because he or she makes himself, herself, the lowest. By controlling the ego, the mysterious leveling, and disappearing into the infinite self instead. Most people who talk out of ego talk to hear themselves. They're not usually interested in what you have to say. While you talk, they are waiting to respond with something bigger and better. So you mention you're taking a vacation, and they mention every vacation they've ever been on. Those people are dreary, because they're insecure, and they have to win you over by trying to impress you. Most of what people say doesn't impress you, does it? Mostly it bores you. If the story of their vacation is particularly interesting or amusing, or there's something to learn from it, okay. But generally speaking, when they're telling you about their vacation, they're only pleasing themselves by trying to combat with you. You're going on a vacation, but they've been on bigger, better, more expensive ones. So be careful with your dialogue and try not to compete with other people. If they talk about their trip to France and you've lived in France for 20 years, don't mention it. Just listen to them. That way you start to develop a style of dialogue that is underneath people. When your ego isn't leaning, pushing, shoving and pressing upon them, you learn more about people and you can love them and support them. By doing so, you exhibit solidity and strength of character. It also allows others to feel supported by your presence, which grants you a silent charisma, silent power. Silent talking involves first watching and listening. Next, it involves projecting love to the person you're listening to or projecting understanding or compassion. You're getting people to voice their insecurities. You're standing tall for people by momentarily subjugating your ego's needs for theirs. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Standing tall and getting underneath others. But it's really a matter of controlling your dialogue so the other person can talk and feel more secure. You don't have to dominate because you don't have to compete. And you don't have to feel more secure. You're perpetually secure. So don't talk gibberish. Most people invent things, exaggerate, or they don't know what they're talking about. They really have a command of what's being discussed. So they'll parrot something they've read in the paper, or they'll take something they saw on TV and regurgitate it for your benefit. Most have no access to real information, so a lot of their attitudes and the information they do have is second-hand. Stay inside what you know. If you're an expert on something, fine. You can talk about it if people ask, but generally speaking, don't talk gibberish and don't bother trying to impress people. It's very difficult to impress people with words, isn't it? Even though you may have done some incredible things, the very fact that you're telling others will make them react negatively. They will compare themselves to you and either see themselves in a bad light, which may make them angry, or consider themselves better than you, so you haven't impressed them anyway. By talking to impress people, you set up a competition. It's irritating. It has certainly irritated you in the past when you've had to sit for half an hour listening to the story of someone's vacation in France. You can imply power and knowledge by not saying much. At most, offer something such as, Ah, yes, certainly, I know, uh-huh, I understand. You can exude silent strength with just a tilt of the head, by rubbing your chin with a wry smile, or by looking people in the eye. Never forget, you were a genius until you open your mouth. So while others are talking, you'll watch and perceive. Notice if their eyes dilate. Watch their hand movements. See if the color of their skin changes. You'll notice if they swallow or blink. Watch the slight changes in the muscles of the face. Notice how people shift position sometimes when they're uncomfortable. If you see their eyes shift quickly down on a diagonal, usually to the left, you'll know that it's a moment of discomfort for them, that it may mean they're lying. When you stand inside your silence, you're in touch with the feelings of the moment. You perceive and understand what is actually being said. 
Anyway, you can lead a conversation without saying very much by asking simple questions. So if you want a conversation to go in a certain way, you pull it along by asking the questions that take it in the required direction. By asking questions, you're exhibiting an interest in other people, and you're supporting them. Then, if they come up with something particularly negative, or express insecurity, you can affirm positivity, you can affirm love, you can affirm life with just a few words. They might remark how terrible a situation is, and you can say, it's not so bad, I'm sure it will resolve itself. Everything comes to pass given time. You allow them to feel that you're there for them. Be shrewd. Resist having to present yourself on the ego's stage. Quiet yourself and watch others. As you silently observe, touch them with your feelings. Ask yourself, silently of course, how do these people feel? What are they actually saying? What do they actually want? Who are they? What is their strongest path? If asked, what is my best response? If they ask you a question, whether you think they should go to France or take a mountaineering trek round the Rockies, for example, don't respond immediately with what you think might be best for them. Pause for a moment. Touch them with your feelings. Feel the response in your subtle feelings that is communicated to you from deep within their reality. Everybody knows the answer to their own question, although sometimes they're not aware of it, for it lies hidden. At best, you can only tell them what they already know. Your logical answer will not necessarily be the correct one. By tapping into their feelings, you'll be amazed how often you come up with an answer that is neither France nor the mountains, but something completely different. Something such as, what I feel might be the best for you is to stay at home for a month, completely clean out your house, order your life, settle your bills and get in control of your affairs. So, as you remain silent, what you're expressing is not only humility, but a care and love for others. It's a finesse that comes from not having to lead. It's an expertise that comes from understanding that you're a spirit, not an ego. Another part of silent talking I should mention is that once you're settled, you can learn to talk passively and equitably. Many people, feeling their disquiet and irritation with life, like to hurt others emotionally, or they're vindictive or judgmental and critical. They shout their abuse and try to depreciate people with verbal violence. It shows them up for what they are, immature and chronically diseased. Don't use verbal violence to hurt people or to make them less, and don't be cynical. The cynics were an ancient Greek sect, despised because of their arrogance and sarcastic contempt for sincerity and merit. They were nicknamed the dogmen. Cynic comes from a Greek word for dog. The cynics were known for their anger and hatred of society, which they displayed by urinating publicly in the street, hence the term dogmen. Don't be a dogman that urinates on people's hopes and dreams. Remember, anybody you criticize or judge personally has to be at the very same energy level as you. If they were not at the same level, you would either not be aware of them or, being in a higher oscillation, you wouldn't bother to comment. Always try to build people up or at least be neutral. To deprecate others is not honorable. It's not necessary. It demonstrates your hidden anger and it lowers your energy. By now, you should be past it. In concluding this particular discussion, let me ask you a question. When a thought goes off in your head, whose thought is it? Most would respond, mine. But how do you know that a particular thought is generated by you? How can you say categorically that it didn't come from somewhere else? Of course, people don't ask that kind of question. We're convinced that the thoughts we generate are ours because that is the way the intellect is programmed. It doesn't care for the idea of its domain being influenced by others. Furthermore, your intellect has no experience of other people's thoughts going off in your head, so it presumes that this does not happen. Not so. My theoretically independent thoughts and your independent thoughts only seem separate from each other. It's an illusion of the intellect that comes from its limited perspective and its need to feel different and separate. In fact, there is no simple way of knowing which thoughts are genuinely yours and which are not. Other people's thoughts constantly permeate your reality, jumping into your mind unannounced, masquerading as yours. You know they do. How often does this happen? You're at a meeting, and your mind is somewhere else. Maybe you're thinking about going skiing. Then the person next to you, for no obvious reason, asks if you've ever been to Aspen, Colorado. They are simple mental jumps that we've all experienced, but deep within the subconscious, you're picking up all manner of thought forms that drift in your direction. You're an antenna, and others are picking up your mental activity. The air is thick, with a continuous flow of silent talking flashing back and forth. At a very deep level of consciousness, in the heart of the global mind, we are all connected. 
The global mind is just one molecule of consciousness, and it is in touch with every part of itself. I accepted this premise intellectually at first, but eventually I understood it deep in my inner feelings. That is why I don't travel and teach so much anymore. I woke to the fact that I could do just as much from within the great quietness, and more effectively to boot. You can do the same. Of course, people of an intellectual bent, experts in matters of mind, will tell you that silent talking is pure drivel. But they're quite wrong. They don't know because they're not seen. Once you see, you'll know. The intellect is too disconnected from the etheric life force, the eternity in all things, and is too focused on itself to comprehend the existence of dimension and phenomena outside its frame of reference. I must say, when people tell me that these other worlds are phony and non-existent, I always make a point of agreeing with them. It's a discipline of silent power not to argue. Arguing and debating is a disease of the ego, much like seriousness is a disease of the ego that comes from either arrogance or insecurity, usually both. I'm happy to leave the intellect alone, attempting to win people over, proselytizing, trying to convince them through dialogue, is a thankless task. It's best to communicate inwardly and wait. Eventually they'll agree, or perhaps they won't. It doesn't matter. We have all of eternity to sort things out. The fact is, we're all inside one collective human dream. That dream can be a nightmare or a celestial vision of exquisite beauty. You pay your money and you make your choice. Chapter 5. The Wisdom of Non-Action In the writings of the old Taoist teachers, there's a concept called Wu Wei, which is the notion of non-action. Initially, it's hard to understand. Wu Wei teaches that through non-action, the sage gains everything. That in quietude, meditation, and emotional serenity, the sage gains a knowledge of the God Force, of the eternal Tao. And in that eternity, he or she has everything. So there's no need to struggle or push to gain respect and material things. In the modern environment, Taoist simplicity doesn't work so well. We usually have to maintain ourselves and pay the rent. We have to participate in modern experiences that were not available in 500 BC when the Tao was written. We have incarnated at this particular time to experience the wonders of the modern world. We need those experiences in order to grow. So non-action in the modern context needs to be slightly modified. We can take the spirit of the Taoist Wu Wei, however, and put that into our life as a further consolidation. Wu Wei is effortless flow. The concept becomes obvious when we compare the difference between striving and working. Striving is leaning emotionally into a goal, a target, yearning for it, feeling pressured by your lack of it, tearing around like a chicken with his head cut off trying to get it. That's striving. Working is moving relentlessly towards your target, one step at a time, in an organized and disciplined way. We can see Wu Wei also in the difference between effort and struggle. In my book, life was never meant to be a struggle, I discussed the fact that many people consider struggle to be honorable. It's a bit silly, really. There's nothing at all honorable about struggling. Usually, if you're struggling, there's something wrong. There's a big difference between struggle and effort. Struggle is action laced with negative emotion. Struggling to finish the job. Struggling to qualify. Struggling to be accepted. Struggling to win people over. Struggling to make ends meet. Effort is a natural part of human existence. You can't walk to the store without effort. You will burn calories getting there, buying your groceries and coming home. Effort is natural. Struggle, however, is effort laced with emotion. It is not the minimal action and flow of Wu Wei. If you find yourself struggling, immediately look to see what the underlying emotion is. Generally, you'll find that you're struggling because the goal you're trying to achieve isn't coming fast enough. For example, you might have a certain financial commitment that requires money to show up quickly, or you might be struggling because your actions are incorrect. Sometimes you're trying to win people over or to convince them of something and they don't want to be won over or convinced. Sometimes struggle comes from having too many things to do, meaning that your life isn't organized. Or struggle can come from the frustration of having placed a goal into a particular time frame only to find that life denies you. As you learn to consolidate silent power, you will learn to embrace Wu Wei. It's really patience and flow, moving away from resistance and towards simplicity, relentlessly moving towards your goal with awareness, adjusting your actions as needs be, moving without emotion and without exerting yourself too much.
Stay within your balance and capabilities and trust the universal law, the Tao, to bring you those things you need. Non-action is the ability to delegate, to be patient, to wait for things to unfold naturally. It's the ability to perceive where your strongest path lies. That isn't so difficult to do. Review your options in a meditation and decide which feels the strongest. Act on your feelings, not only on your intellect. Wu Wei is manifest in the ability to turn back. Retreat can sometimes be the most powerful tool in your bag of tricks. It's the ability to walk away when things aren't right. The ability to leave a relationship if it doesn't work. The ability to say no when people are trying to suck you into actions that are degrading or when things don't fit into your ideals of spirituality, of proper action, of goodness. When you can say no, you are free. When you have to have the job, or you're obliged by need to act in a certain way, when you have to win somebody's friendship, when you have to have $5,000 by next Thursday, you're not free, you're in prison. So Wu Wei is accepting life and not forcing it. It's being aware of the ebb and flow of the seasons, aware of the spirituality of all things, aware that in the great abundance of the God Force, there is no time. It is knowing when to act and not acting until you know. You can wait forever if you have to. You are eternal. Wu Wei is being content with what you are, with who you are, and what you have now. It's knowing that abundance and experiences and relationships of real worth come only when and if you're settled. When you're balanced, the universe provides. More will always be there. Wu Wei is the act of not pushing, not forcing. Be the silent control person who is moving relentlessly towards freedom and away from restriction, towards your goals one step at a time, in an organized, patient way. Wu Wei is also the ability to get around the blocks you experience as you try to materialize ideas and goals. When life doesn't want to dance to your tune, start by asking yourself these questions. Am I in the right place? Am I too early or too late? Am I going too fast? Do I need more patience? Do I need time to consolidate? to create an energy within myself that is compatible with my goal? Am I trying for something that is too far in the distance? Do I need to set a goal closer to where I am now? Ask yourself, is what I want appropriate? Does my plan infringe on other people? Does it require them to be something they don't want to be, to do things they don't want to do? If I'm involving other people, what's in it for them? Maybe the resistance comes from the fact that you've forgotten to include them. Have I looked after and honored everybody? Make sure they're happy and ready to perform. Is what I want self-indulgent? Will it assist me in growing and becoming a better person, in achieving a more fulfilling life? Or am I just indulging myself? Remember, many of the things you want are in fact dead weights, prisons you create for yourself. More often than not, material things wear you down because you have to look after them and worry about them. Sometimes the deeper spiritual part of you, the infinite self within, protects you from disaster. You'll head off trying to achieve something that the inner spiritual you, the deeper subconscious self, doesn't actually want. So it'll make sure you arrive too late, or the person you seek will not be there, or the check bounces and things generally don't work. If things really are not working and they turn out to be a mess, you have to think, hey, is this because of something deep inside of me? Do I really want what I think I want? Am I committed to the idea or not? What are the consequences, obligations and energies involved? Am I investing too much of myself in the idea? Perhaps it won't mean much to me when I get it. I'm sure you've had the experience of going for something and getting it and then realizing that the prize wasn't worth the energy you expended. It was a disappointment. So be careful that you don't hurtle off up some path just to prove what a hotshot you are, without thinking through your actions, whether they actually do anything for you. 
The other question to ask yourself is, are my actions powerful and appropriate? A few small, powerful actions are worth a hundred hours of diddling about. There is a school of thought that says, when faced with an obstacle, whack your head against it until the thing breaks. Then move to the next obstacle and whack it with whatever part of your skull still remains. I'm not keen on that idea. It seems to lack finesse. When you're faced with an obstacle, step back and take a long, hard look at what it is telling you. More often than not, you can adapt and walk around it. Sometimes you have to wait while you raise your energy enough to fall over the obstacle effortlessly. Don't whack your head against it. Stop. Get inside your power. Plot how you're going to get around it, how you're going to materialize the sales you need, for example, and how you can more effectively present your information to people. No, don't use your head to power yourself forward by whacking it on things. Instead, use it silently to feel out where your strongest path lies. That is silent power. From non-action, let's go to the silent, subtle nature of feelings. Chapter 6. Developing Subtle Feelings As I said in Chapter 1, we each emit a subtle, etheric feeling. It has a precise identity like a thumbprint, patterned in a complex web of energy. People perceive your consolidated power subliminally, and they respond accordingly. The subliminal feeling you exude is the real you. Life responds precisely and exactly to the subliminal feeling you emit. That is why sometimes your mind expects one thing and life gives you something else. Emotions are the outcropping of opinions and preferences. If you had no opinions or preferences, life could not contradict you and you could not experience negative emotion. Of course, the key to serenity is not necessarily in satisfying your ego's preferences. Rather, it is in reducing your preferences and absolute. Everything exudes the God Force, even inanimate objects. In addition, everything that comes into contact with human beings is imbued with the subtle imprint that our thoughts, emotions and etheric mark upon the object. Nothing much is lost, but sometimes it changes. If you play a CD, the music given off imprints the walls of the room. Every sound wave is layered one upon the other, but most can't see it because they don't know the imprint is there and because they're too obsessed with self, too cluttered. Imagine a human with a 90-piece brass band playing on her head. The umpa umpa is so loud that she can't concentrate on anything else. She's living in the center of a mental tornado. Her ego is strong, her personality dominant, all subtle feelings are swamped. The personality prefers to hear see and feel things that please it or endorse it. The mind focuses on what is congruent with its desires and eliminates everything else. Perception is thus narrowed by selection. If you want to access the mysterious global memory and expand your silent power, here's what you need to do. First, close down the chatter of the mind with meditation, discipline and mental control. Fasting is good. The mind goes very quiet when you don't eat. You might also want to try a talking fast for 24 hours, during which you don't allow yourself to talk. Silence, time on your own, physical exercise, and a light, low-protein, low-volume diet all help in the general raising of your energy. Discipline gives you confidence, serenity, and power. Next, start to exercise your perception by commanding your mind to notice everything, even the most inconsequential of detail. It is part of the discipline of going from asleep to awake. Train your mind to reclaim the subtlety of perception which over the years you have programmed it to disregard. How a person looks is often the same as how they feel. Over the years, your face changes to reflect your predominant emotions. Your walk, your posture, and the expression and shape of your face provide an external blueprint of your inner self. People who are weak and insecure have a defensive upper body posture. Their eyes shift left and right and up and down more rapidly and more often than a solid person. If you meet any true sages, you'll notice that their eyes move slowly, casting back and forth, or they look straight ahead. Information situated to their immediate left and right will be picked up via their peripheral vision, which will have become powerful over the years. 
To develop perception, you only have to ask yourself for information that you don't normally seek visual and auditory information and of course we can learn a lot by how people smell we don't usually think of smelling others unless a person has terrible bo but as you exercise that sense you become more and more sensitive to odor and you'll notice that each person's is quite distinct it tells you things as you heighten your perception by watching you learn very quickly and now you're ready to heighten your subtle feelings we're not just interconnected because we're made of the same material, we're also interconnected spiritually. I believe that inanimate objects, as well as animals, insects and plants, all have a spiritual evolution. I believe that there is a collective spirit for the water rat, a collective spirit for the ant, a collective spirit for the eagle and so on. Each species evolves and grows just as you evolve and grow. The nature self describes your metaphysical interconnection to all things physical. You are a part of a great evolutionary story. Even though you are a human, you have not completely left the lower evolutions of, say, animal, and you are not denied access to the higher realms of spirit, because a part of you is already there. The evolution of the animal kingdom is a pristine, humble evolution, one of pure spirit uncluttered by ego. The animals have much to teach us in their ways. They remind us of a time when natural simplicity and flow reigned, before the modern era when the ego was crowned king of this physical dimension. In the concept of silent power and your growth, it is vital to expand your awareness across these lesser dimensions. Silently draw upon the spirits of nature, calling upon them to instruct you, to show you the simplicity and sacredness of their ways. You can stand by a tree and pull the energy of the tree through you to cleanse your body etherically. You can rest by a lake and use the lake to heal your confusion, anguish and disquietude. You can use the power of a thunderstorm when you wish to perceive a higher destiny for yourself, or the power of a fire to cleanse your ideas and emotions and transmute them to a higher place. As a part of the greater understanding of the nature self, there is also a responsibility that few people are aware of. It's a responsibility to project energy to those spiritual evolutions, such as the animals, that are oscillating more slowly than we are, let's say, vibrating in a less complicated way. So we love and honor the spirits of nature, the various species of trees, the things that crawl in the ground, the denizens of the water and the birds. Just as the dimensions above offer you healing, serenity and freshness, so you can offer the animals a heightened evolution. When you concentrate on an animal or touch it, it evolves. When you concentrate on the plants, the things in the water and in the air, they grow. Just by loving a bird and watching it as it flies, its evolution is enhanced. The beauty of the nature self is aligned with the seasons, aligned with temperance and calm, with an eternal infinite evolution. It is there, in the nature self, that you experience the eternal Tao, the simplicity of all things. Be gracious, bless the lesser spirits and assist them. In this way you empower your journey from ego to spirit, from clutter to clarity, from uncertainty to the consolidation of silent power. Be gracious. Chapter 8. Extrasensory Etheric Perception To view the etheric you need good peripheral perception. In the center of the eye are the cells known as the cones. They are used to perceive direct light and color. The cells at the side of the eye are known as the rods. They are colorblind, but very much more sensitive than the cones. Over tens of thousands of years, we human beings have lost our peripheral perception because we don't need it to keep us safe in the forest anymore. The etheric is too faint and moves too fast for the cones to see. It's subtle. And because it's hard to see in bright sunlight and strong artificial light such as neon, the etheric is best seen in diffused light or in the light of dusk. You develop peripheral perception by engaging it, which is nothing more than telling yourself you want to reclaim that perception and periodically focusing your attention on what is to your left and what is to your right. Place your hands either side of your face about 18 inches away. Pull them back behind you and watch them simultaneously without moving your eyes to one side or the other. See how long it takes before they disappear. By activating your peripheral perception, you will, in time, see the etheric. The other thing that helps you is to have a more rarefied diet. It increases your sensitivity. So if your diet is very light or vegetarian, you become more aware of the subtle energies of life. The other way to see the etheric is to fast. 
As you fast, your brain waves start to slow down, your metaphysical energy quickens, and as your metabolism slows, your mind goes quiet. Fasting takes you out of the ego's consciousness of survival, and you begin to straddle metaphysical dimensions. The first of these is the etheric. Quietening your energy allows you to see out from within your own bubble of energy to the energy of others. In addition, I've noticed that believing in oneself and believing in these mysterious inner worlds helps a great deal in opening the etheric door for you. In the early days, I thought I believed, and then I hoped I believed, and some years later, I knew that I believed. That helped. However, you don't have to learn to see the etheric in order to be aware of it, because you can feel it. This human evolution evokes great awe. Silent power offers you access to many worlds. I can't go through all of them in the scope of this little book, but I can give you a clue and leave you at the crossroads, so to speak. First the discipline, then the crossroads. The discipline. See the world as energy and become responsible for your energy. Realize that everything you do and say and touch, everything you pass, even for a fleeting second, is affected and changed by you. You impact the animals and plants, the air, water and buildings and people. The energy of each drops or rises to reflect the subtle etheric pressure you place on it. When you're angry, you impress that upon the house plants and they start to die. When you're fearful, the dog sucks that up via etheric and gets sick. When you're mean and vindictive, the energy of the room you're in starts to wobble and act chaotically. It metaphysically starts to implode. Anyone standing nearby will be robbed of energy and pulled down. Externally, reality shrinks and disappears, for you anyway. That's why car wrecks are common when a person is in a rage. Their perception of external reality is lost. They are momentarily blind. They can't see oncoming cars and reality whacks them broadside. With perception comes responsibility. Understand that if you're infinite, you're everywhere, and you can be anywhere, and you can be inside all things, and you affect them. Enough said. The crossroads. Remember that the solidity of the world is an illusion created by the speed at which atoms oscillate. If they slowed down just a little, you'd be able to walk through walls. In an out-of-body experience, you can have consciousness inside a subtle body that we believe weighs four grams. You can pass right through the wall. In effect, physical reality is both opaque and ethereal, just a collective feeling. It's only by habit that you consider yourself solid. In a sense, you're a collection of particles, but once out of the emotion of the world, you're no longer observable. You are less solid. Silent talking takes you to all parts of the global feeling simultaneously. It is simpler and cheaper than promos, hype, and the air travel needed to communicate with people's intellects. If you're solid, well-defined, and in emotional control, with a good sense of your infinite self, you have a confidence that brings a solidity to your energy, as distinct from the chaotic pattern that is normally projected. Your defense lies in consolidation and silent strength, and in being disciplined and well contained. Other etherics will not interfere with yours. They'll bounce off you as you pass. In addition, if you project love for humanity and have little resistance, incoming energy often passes right through you. It has no place to attach. Because of your spiritual perspective and the love you project, your oscillation is not congruent with the lower, depreciating energy of the ego's world. For example, if you're celibate or you project no sexual energy, it's impossible for another to hold a sexual visualization of you for more than a fleeting second. The thought form slides away like a knife point pressed onto a slippery surface. Your best defense is to have little criticism and judgment of others and no rancor, hatred or animosity. The best defense is to have nothing to defend. The more you're not locked into reality via criticism and definition, the more opaque you become. It's a type of invisibility. You are here and not here, in the evolution and distant from it. Trust in the great goodness to keep you safe. It will. Finally, it should be a part of your daily discipline to silently project love and peace to all whom you meet. As you pass people in the street, look them in the eye and silently say love and press that love into their hearts. Do that to everyone without fail and gradually you will develop a resounding sense of unconditional acceptance. That's the best protection. Chapter 10. Conclusion.
I know it's hard to exude confidence if you don't feel completely solid, but you can fake it until you make it. Just by maintaining silence, not leaning, not pushing, not yearning, and controlling your emotional reactions, you dominate your psychology. You act out a silent strength even though you may not be resonating it deeply within as yet. Don't give yourself away. Work quietly on your weaknesses. Develop a reserve and mystery. Be organized and self-sufficient. And keep your life to yourself. Knowledge is power. The knowledge you never speak of is silent power. Consume less. Stay in control. Be at one with your inner self and nature. Purify your life, constantly skimming, cleaning, throwing things out, simplifying. One morning you wake up and the power is all there. You won't have to cover up your disquietude, it will have melted away. A great unfolding awaits you as you begin to understand that you can dominate this human evolution of yours, even from a humble position. You don't have to be a superstar. In fact, the superstars often show their weakness by having to stand out and preen themselves and strut to mask their worries and insecurities. Most of the rah-rah is there to cover up an inner self that's none too solid. Do this. Draw a line in the sand. Agree to step across to a new way of dealing with life. Set up a sacred week for yourself. Pray to your God and call on your infinite self and the nature spirits and all the great powers to help you make the changes you need. Meditate each day. Fast for a day or two during the week. Also pick 24 hours during which you will maintain complete silence. Read, bathe, rest, purify, walk in the forest, pull energy from the earth, become friends with the water, let the spirits of air blow away any confusion and ask it to grant you a vision of the future. Let it show you how the God Force can warm your heart and how it will empower your detachment so you can consolidate your serenity and your poise. It's time for you to come back to the sacred place to which you belong and step inside the gentle embrace of the great goodness. Remember, there was a time eons ago when our people had perception before it was lost in clutter, insecurity, and self-delusion. Claim that perception as yours and learn to touch the etheric. Use the life force and rekindle the old ways within you so that others might remember also. Step now to an alternative evolution, beyond hesitancy and fear, beyond the common emotions. Step now to that pristine place within. No matter if you can't see it as yet, believe and walk in. It will welcome you, I assure you, and it will teach you in the years to come. There is much there for you to learn, strange aspects of this incredible journey that few really understand. Much wisdom and many things await. And in your sacred week, pray for yourself and pray for all humanity and the animals and the little things and ask that the Great Spirit descend upon us all. Ask it to help us restore a sacred, silent power. Ask it to open our eyes so that over time the light flowing from the great goodness will establish a world of simplicity bathed in the kindness of a settled heart, each human spirit gracious, respectful, and each contributing in his or her humble way to the greater understanding of this strange but glorious human experience. The world of the ego will change in the coming decades and, over a few hundred years, a new perception will rise from the burnt-out ashes of this evolutionary phase. People will want to return to the sacred ways of long ago. It will seem natural and proper. Eventually we'll see a world steeped in honor and balance, dressed in the unassuming vestments of unconditional love and serenity. Embrace your silent power. Come, be brave. A great awakening is yours for the asking. Then offer your perception and silent power in service to others. Be subtle. Don't force people. Teach them by example. Lead them from behind, gradually, with a touch here and a word there. Lead them from their pain, out of the darkness, across the invisible bridge, to the land of perpetual light, wherein dwells the enormity of the great goodness, waiting patiently for each to arrive. Come, step, your time is now.